Welcome to the EV Ready Podcast, featuring industry leaders and their perspectives on electrification, hosted by EV Ready Energy. Hey, everybody, this is Chris Nye, and welcome to the EV Ready Podcast. Today, I have Nathan Donald, the Senior Director of EV Partnerships at Laz Parking. Thank you for joining, man. How you doing? Good. How you doing, Chris? Good to see you. Uh, you too. You too. Um, hey, I uh, I appreciate you joining. Uh, I was excited to talk about this because, because parking's tough in the EV industry. Uh, so I guess before I get down the rabbit hole, tell everybody a little bit about you, your background, and how you got to where you got to. Yeah, I've got a unique uh, way into the parking industry. I, my career started, sales career started uh, working as um, a delivery driver for Anheuser Bud, so for Budweiser, and my, worked my, my way up. Best from, friend, yes, I was. I was everybody's best friend. Um, <laughs> so at 21 years old, I started delivering beer, moved my way into a supervisor role, then into sales, into sales management. And after about nine years of that, I decided it, it may be time for a change. I had two young children. I was up late at night at. at doing promos at bars and it just wasn't a, a real really good fit for my family and so i was having lunch with a really good friend of mine at the time that owned an access control company in phoenix arizona and he said hey we're starting this new vertical in parking selling parking equipment to garages all over the state of arizona and new mexico a little bit of southern california and so i said well like how hard is it to sell gates like it's a ticket spitter and a gate that goes up and down like that seems to be super easy so I took the job and within the first three days, I realized there's a lot more to parking than just ticket spitters and gates, right? There's software, there's actual platforms that are involved that allow you to do some pretty robust things in the industry. And so it got me really excited, kind of started geeking out on it. And so I spent seven years in that with that organization and then was recruited to a, uh, a Canadian organization that was doing some different tech more in the what we call the on-street environment. So like payments for parking, if you park on the street in a municipality or anywhere else. And so I wanted to do it, continue to grow my knowledge in the parking world. And so I took that job. Um, and from there was recruited to do uh, mobile payments. Again, progressively kind of just doing different things within the industry. And this mobile payment company was a startup at the time, uh, had 30 clients. People were just then starting to use apps uh, for anything. And so we're like, oh, why not use an app to pay for parking? Right. And so we spent about five years in that organization, really growing it from the three, the 30 clients that we had to 350 a night when I left. And then from there, kind of slowly started getting into as, as the evolution of parking kept, you know, moving in different directions. I kept kind of following that evolution and trying to find something. I started getting, not, not say getting bored, but just trying to find something that was really going to paint right? Drastically train, trained our organization as an industry. And the job that I took after the mobile payment organization allowed me to do some European travel for business. And I was over in, in Amsterdam and I saw what they were doing in parking. and I thought it was super fascinating. Essentially, they allowed any driver to use essentially any app to pay for parking. So you didn't have to just like, if you're in San Francisco, you had to use one app. If you're in Oakland, you had to use another app. And so it'd be kind of one of those app fatigue things, right? I, I kind of equated like you go to a restaurant and they only, they only accept Discover card. I would, I wouldn't be able to eat there, right? Cause I don't have a Discover card. And so I was like, why are we limiting drivers to be able to use one app? Why can't drivers use any app they want as long as they adhere to these rules? And so I came back from a business trip and had dinner with a best friend of mine used to be and now business partner. And I was talking to him about this and he's in the industry and he said, why don't we do something? I was like, why don't we just bring this over to the States? And I was like, well, first of all, neither one of us know anything about tech. We can sell it. We can sell the dream, but we don't know how to build it. And he's like, okay, well, let's just find something to build it. Like it's super, like it's super easy, right? Like this is, this is the, the this is the brain of two guys that just like to offer a solution to our Rolodex that we believe is, would be beneficial. And so six months into this kind of designing and whiteboarding, do different things, we met our third business partner and he was a tech guy. So he built his own tech and we ran it past him and he said, I'll build it for you. And I was like, really? And he's like, yeah, we'll build it for you. So we worked out a deal financially to be able for him to come in, build the tech. He built it 90, in 90 days. And so 90 days, we're ready to go. So my first uh I get my first contract 90 days later. So six months later, I get my first contract. And unfortunately, right at that time, COVID and the world stopped. 
right? Like parking stopped. No one paid for parking. No one was going to work. Cities weren't giving tickets for parking. It just became really a really hard industry to, to do anything with. And so right at that time, I was being recruited by Michael Hughes, the chief revenue officer at the time with ChargePoint. He recruited me to come over and really build out a program for EV charging with parking operators in the industry. And so I was like, well, like this is really also really cool to, to kind of get in this EV world because it's such an evolving industry and it's 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 still evolving to this day. And so I thought, yeah, this would be really good to do that. And so that's where you and I met is is in at ChargePoint. So I spent three and a half years at ChargePoint. At the time, I've had a really good relationship with the Laz team. The founders of Laz I've known for almost 20 years with all those other organizations that I was with. Um, they had a position that came up, but they, they created a position basically to build out an, an EV program for LAS parking, right? So LAS has almost 4,000 locations in the United States. We manage, own, or lease roughly 1.6 million spaces. And um, those spaces are being used by people that drive EVs. And so we're like, well, we, we need to get into this world, right? They're, if we don't get into it, somebody else is going to get into it, and we're going to be kind of out of that you know, sphere of influence. And so they brought me on to essentially build a program for our portfolio on level two to allow us to do, and I call it Lazify it. And so I like, and those are all these really unique things, but allow us to do things that we do in our regular parking operations, right? And so that's what we're in the process of doing today. I've been with Laz for six months and I firmly believe this is my forever home. This is a really cool industry. They're really great people. They are a family. And yeah, I'm in, I'm really, really excited. Good. That's awesome. So my first question, uh, I've had an electric vehicle for 10 years. I have had so many challenging parking uh, uh, circumstances with an electric vehicle across the U.S. Um, with within large parking garages, whether it's you know, you go in and they're non-network stations and they're in use or they're, they're network stations, but something's blocking it or they're broken or they're, you're, there's an, uh, a gas car that's that's in the parking space. Like it, it, it's been tough. And so what do you view? Like, why is it so difficult in the parking space? And, and like, what are you looking forward to kind of implementing to, to change that? Well, I can tell you, you're not, you're not the only one. So I know that I have had frustrations with EVs and commercial parking structures public parking in general, uh, for all the same reason you have. And not to, I mean, even I can add even more reasons, right? Like it's, they're broken, they're offline, they don't work, uh, they're ice, all these different things are happening. So for me and for Laz, we believe that the reason why we really need to kind of step in here and what's been so challenging in this space is that we're not able to manage that space correctly. Meaning we weren't involved in the conversation. So I would say like a vendor comes in whether it's whatever company it is, they come in, they go to the asset owner because that's the person that owns the garage. They're the ones that are signing the check. And so they sell them EV charging stations. The asset owner contracts our key management out to companies like Labs, but they don't bring Labs into the conversation and say, hey, we have this opportunity to, to put in EV charging stations. How can we roll this into parking operations to ensure that our customers, the drivers are getting the a seamless transaction, a seamless session, the charging stations work, they're available, are they being used, like all these different things, right? And so we show up to work one day, or our team shows up to work one day, and all of a sudden there's chargers being installed. We have no idea what type of charger it is. We have no idea who to contact if a charger goes offline or is broken. We don't know who's charging the fees, where the money is going, if there is a fee being charged, right? There's so much, we're, we're basically cut out of the situation. And that's a challenge for a parking operator in general is we're managing that space. And now you've changed that space into a little bit different management style. And we needed to be more involved in that. And so what we've done is we're working our way to get more involved in that in that space. Yeah. And, and so if you were talking to an owner, like if you were just sitting down having a beer with an owner, what would you tell them? What are you going to do? I would say I love the fact that they're looking to actually put in charging stations in a location because I do believe that there is a need. If the car is sitting idle, I believe there's an opportunity to charge it, right? It's a need. It's different than gas-powered vehicles, right? Gas-powered vehicles, we've all had them in our in our past. Typically, when you're driving into, when you're driving to and from, you know, point A to point B, you're going to stop at a gas station when you need gas, fill up, go up on your way. The world we live in, in the EV world, if the car is sitting idle, 
really that's when you want to start to fuel up. And in most cases, the locations that we manage, vehicles are sitting idle for anywhere from two to eight hours a day, right? And so I would say, awesome, you're on the right track. You're trying to future proof your location. You're trying to drive more traffic into the location. Have you had a discussion with the vendor that you're using? Do you have access to the data? Where's the money's flowing if you're charging a, a fee to use these chargers? Who is managing the, the data? Who's actually an, uh, analyzing the data to make sure that the chargers are being used in a way that's, that's going to be the most efficient for that location? Uh, and also, ultimately, who do you call for service? Because it's a moving part. Things break. Things go down because it's online. So who's doing that? In a lot of cases, these property owners will kind of a set it and forget it mentality. It's like, well, it's in the garage. That's out of my building. Go ahead. It's, it's supposed to work fine. So ultimately, that's kind of where I would say to them is let's get involved. Let's actually look at this thing in a different way. So from, you know, I'll, I'll, and I imagine you must have the responsibility now of kind of training an entire company on how to go manage parking garages. But at the same time, you're also uh, training a, a team on how to educate owners ownership on on what to think about, what to consider. Both of those things at the same time uh, at how many locations? Almost 4,000. <laughs> yeah. I, and we're adding, we add roughly seven locations a week. Like we are, we're, we're growing them in. Okay. Wow. That's no joke. Um, yeah. Okay. So you obviously have a big team that's going to be doing this uh, across the United States. What, what would be the, the three things in terms of developing from an electrification standpoint? Well, what are the three things that you're kind of looking to train your team on how to educate or how to perform in these locations to you know, provide a better experience and increase adoption? It's a great question. And that's actually probably my biggest challenge to date at last is educating 15,000 people, right? Because that's how many employees we have. And being able to take some information, give it to them, give it to them, whether it's through email, whether it's through webinars, whether it's through uh, ongoing, you know, phone calls and or meetings, because each region that we, that we run has their own weekly, bi-weekly meetings. Well, I'm only one person, right? So I can't be on every call. I can't be on everything. So it's just ongoing education because ultimately I can give them all the information they need. But as soon as they walk away from their computer and they start keeping the lights on and keeping the garages clean and making sure everybody's safe in those locations and dealing with customers and dealing with the asset owners and just all of the stuff that we have to deal with on a daily basis, you tend to forget about until then all of a sudden we get a phone call from the asset owner or a vendor that says, hey, I'd like to install charging stations at your location. Then it's, well, wait, I know somebody. Or, hey, we, we were offering that. Or, hey, we're doing something there. And so it's the ongoing, how do I keep it front and center with the 15,000 people that we employ? At least, right? That's yeah. the biggest thing. I'm sure it's tough because like anything, like EV, I always joke around that like EV is like a, um, you know, you can't, maybe you can now, maybe I'm out of date, but, but in college, when I, when I was in college, there wasn't too much information on it. And it really is like this complex thing. And, you know, when you have another job where you're focusing on five or 10 other things, it probably feels difficult or it feels like a nuisance um, and challenging. And I think it's just really important to simplify the message because obviously it can get complicated quickly. It really can. And and I'm just scratching the surface. I mean, I've been in the, in the EV world for just now four years and a lot has changed in even the four years that I've been in the industry and it's continuing to, and it's continuing to progress in the right direction. But you, you know, you also hear the stories of like what we talked about at the beginning of this conversation of on the horse stories. But I'm never buying an EV because I can't ever find a charger that actually works. I actually have a story of a really, one of my really good friends that rented an EV um, on a business trip. And when he, when he got into the car, it was at 20%. And so he's like, okay, I'll figure this out. Like, so he, he gets on, right? Goes on the app or, you know, wherever he needs to go to find an EV charger to save them. So he goes to their first one. It doesn't work. He's like, all right, so now I'm down to like 15%, but there's another one right up the road. So he goes to the next one and plugs in and he gets like 5% in like 45 minutes. And he's like, this, I still have an hour drive. Like I'm, I'm now worried because again, it's the mentality of the gas powered vehicle drivers, right? Totally. And so having that 
just the naysayers or the people who are like, we're not there yet. I kind of, I, you know, when talking to people, I'm like, it's the chicken to the egg, right? We have all these EVs on the road. Do we have enough charging stations? And are the charging stations in the right location? Are they being managed correctly? Is it, uh, is, does the business case work, right? Because as I said, we have almost 4,000 locations. I would say that not one location is exactly the same as each other. There's different parkers that go into those locations. One can be an event venue. One can be a workspace. One can be a multi-tenant residential. One can be retail. Like there's so many different use cases. And so you need to be able to offer a solution that has the ability to adapt and or evolve when different uses, use cases come up. That is key to be able to continue education on that. And so for me, I just think that as long as I can continue to make a simple, I don't want to call it an ele- elevator pitch, but if I can give the tools to my team to be able to just at a high level, understand what charging is and what EV charging can do at a facility. If it starts to get any deeper than that, call me. I'll eat. If I don't know the answer, I'll call you because I know you know more than I do about it. And then ultimately get the right people involved to ensure that we get the right answers. And, you know, I don't expect to know anything or everything, but it's, yeah, we should know enough. Now, uh, obviously over the next five years or so, as you're electrifying, and I imagine that it's going to be kind of like a hockey stick over the next, let's just call it 10 years or so, but you know, whatever the timeline is. And, and most of your owners, their first question is how much money is this going to cost? Because if you don't really understand the value, but you think it's expensive, like no one's going to say yes. Uh, and then on the on the employee side, if it feels like a complex additional project, it might be something that you tend to avoid in conversation because, you know, what's the incentive? And so uh, obviously, you know, you're aware that there's billions of dollars in funding across the United States that's going to help subsidize this this program for you. How do you intend on kind of educating owners and your team on on going after that? Yeah. So what we've done in this program that we're putting together is that we are going after what we call the lowest hanging fruit. And the lowest hanging fruit is essentially the, the money that there we have, we can get access to. And so there are locations, whether it's city, whether it's state utility programs that are offering these incentive programs that allow us to make it easier to get infrastructure put in place and to get charging stations in the ground. So that by first for me is I'm going after myself and my team are going after the lowest hanging fruit locations that have access to incentives. And then ultimately, part of that is bringing in the right installation partners that can help with the whole entire process, right? Whether it's not only finding incentives, but helping the asset owner apply uh, and or getting the right information to put the packet together to then apply for it. And then ultimately, once that application is submitted, then essentially start the process of getting the installation put in place. It's not a, it's not a, you and I both know it's not a quick thing, right? I mean, I, we've signed, you know, contracts and deals that have taken, I know one, when I was at ChargePoint, that took me almost three years to get it from contract signing to installation. So there's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of things that are going in there and having the right installation partners that can help along the way to make that as easy as possible to take that burden off of the asset owner because ultimately the asset owner, they don't know what they don't know. And so they essentially are looking for the right people to help them through that process. So lowest hanging fruit, kind of a bullseye approach and then start to move out where we start looking at demand. So now the next location is once we find the money and we go after those locations, then we start moving out into the outer skirts of that where it's like, okay, where's the demand at that, that may not have incentives? But we know people are asking and we know people need charges. And so that's the next one. And then the last one is essentially everything else. So there are certain areas that we manage throughout the country that there are no incentives available today and the demand's not there yet. It will be there someday, but the demand's not there yet. We're not spending a whole lot of time in those areas, but we still need to educate those people because conversations will happen. Things will come up. If you look at the media, even once a day, you're going to see something about EV. You're going to see something about what's going on with all this money that's, you know, that's been flooded into the marketplace. People ask about it. And so ultimately, we just need to make sure that we're in the right spot at the right time to access. Last question for you. This, maybe this is an easy answer. Maybe it has nothing to do with it. I remember when we were in COVID, uh, and this is probably closer to when we were working together, and COVID hits, parking garages aren't being used as much. Uh, or maybe some parking garages are being used more. That tells you how much I know about the industry, but I'm thinking like multifamily, whatever the case may be. Um, and there was a lot of lot of discussion about like what are these spaces going to turn into. That's my question for you: is like what 
is there is there a new way to use the space or a new technology that uh, people should be expecting in the parking space over the next, let's just call it 10 years? Yeah. Well, so we're, Glass is doing some unique things that I don't think that a lot of other parking operators are doing. So we actually have a, an entire partnership team and I'm a part of that team, but we have a partnership team that actually goes out and, and really tries to find this, what exactly you're talking about. Like, wh- how can we utilize spaces, real estate? That is that may be underutilized, and so I'll give you a really good example. So we have we just created a partnership with a company that is putting a, a and I'm gonna call them pop up, but they are they can be moved soccer fields that they're putting on top of parking structures, and so you know the tops of parking structures in a lot of locations are are not as used as much as the other levels of parking garages in those areas, and they're actually. So we're in the process right now with this partner of actually creating one of these pop-ups and it's just the soccer field that allows people to come in and actually play soccer in an urban environment at a location that's not being used. And so these are the kind of things that we're looking at. And that's like kind of an outlier situation, that's but the that's stuff. the kind of, that's the kind of stuff that we really, really have a good time. With. And so like, that's a good example. Another example is start looking like e-bike storage lockers for first and last mile, you know, like deliveries you know, hubs for that as well. Like these are all things that we're looking at bringing as a a value add to the asset owner because essentially it's a garage, right? It's made for parking cars. And a lot of these garages that we manage are actually 30 plus years old, right? So they don't have power capacity. They don't have the way to get, you know, an EV, like even a bank of 10, you know, level two chargers in there. That's a challenge, right? And so we have to figure out ways to actually utilize these spaces, drive more traffic, which drives more revenue for the asset owner, which makes us as a parking operator more sticky to them and creates value as that. And so our partnership team is actively seeking out different ideas, like what I just told you about the sport court up on top of the roof. Another example would be like a, like a almost like a mobile car wash, right? And so we're bringing car washes into garages that, that don't use the same amount of water that a regular standard car wash would use. And so these are all different things that we're looking at trying to figure out, like, how do we get into this, into these different things that essentially is just going to drive more traffic to these locations for our, for our point. Last question on this note. Sorry, I said I wouldn't bring it back to EV, but <laughs> okay. uh, I'm, I imagine uh, transportation network companies, Uber, Lyfts, or just companies who are trying to build hubs in big cities, like that must be a hot spot for you. It absolutely is. Um I mean, ultimately, if you think about it, that's where the majority of those those short rides are taking place, right? So I, I think like urban environments that there's this constant last mile, like one to five mile rides. Uh, also like airport, right? So the pickup drop off locations, event venues is another really big one, a big space where there's an influx of people coming in and out. And that need those ride sharing companies to be able to have those things. And then ultimately... When you, you know that, that, I mean, that's an option in a rideshare. Like if you use any type of rideshare app, the option is if you want to pick an EV, right? And people are, you may not own one, but at least you want to try to do your part, right? And so people are actually choosing that as an option. And so those vehicles need to figure out a way to, to get charging. And it's not just level two charging, it's level three charging. So we just recently uh, partnered up with BP, which is British Petroleum, top 25 company in the world. BP has really gone in into the EV space to try to continue to build out DC fast charging hubs around urban environments. And so we're working with BP um, and our clients to find those hubs that allow them the ability to put these hubs in and then create a long-term lease for that asset owner to be able to put these, these networks in. So again, kind of full circle, not just level two, we're looking at level three as well. We know there's a need for that in the short term parking space facility or an environment like I just talked about. It's exciting, right? There's a lot of there's a lot of opportunity out there today to be able to to do some really cool things. It just takes time. And it takes people like you and I that just really geek out on this. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say like you get my mind racing and it's probably hard. It's for a large company it's really important probably to have like specialized people in each of these things because obviously like it gets complicated very quickly. Yeah. It absolutely is. It really does. Well, hey, thanks so much for the time. Appreciate you talking about Laz and what everyone's up to. And uh, I'm sure I'll see you soon. Thanks for the invite, man. It's been a pleasure. I really enjoy it. Yeah, absolutely. All right, take care. (laughs) Thanks.